Yes. Uh, yes, um, you won't have to worry about reading them, but I will read them to you. Definitely, yeah, they'll stay there and you're welcome to go in and interact with people as well. We definitely encourage the speakers to do that. Hello everyone, my name is Ethan Ortega and I am the manager for Los Luceros Historic Site. And I'd like to welcome you all to our virtual edition of Mesa Talks. Uh, this is a collaborative lecture series between Los Luceros Historic Site and Mesa Prieta Petroglyph Project. Uh, we will be hosting these in person uh, once we are allowed to, but currently due to the COVID pandemic, both Mesa Prieta Petroglyph Project and Los Luceros Historic Site are closed to the, to the public. 
Um, but uh, we are happy to host the talks here. Uh, and tonight, uh, we have a great speaker in line for you. Uh, but first, I'd like to share with you our next lecture. Um, so tune in on September 29th at 6 p.m. Uh, and that will be a talk on gubernador polychrome. Um, and that's by Tim Wilcox. Uh, he's of Okeowinge Pueblo uh, and works for Crow Canyon. Um, and so that'll be a great lecture. Uh, but tonight uh, we have Candy Bordun, um, and she is the recording director for Mesa Prieta Petroglyph Project. And she's gonna be sharing with us the best of the best from the recording project in 2019. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Candy. Uh, and just remember, if you have any questions during the talk, you can put them in the comment box. We'll be monitoring those questions. And uh, throughout the talk, Candy will pause to answer uh, the questions you might have or the comments about some of the amazing rock art that she has. All right, without further ado, here is Candy Bordeaux. Thank you, Ethan. Um, and thank you, Chester, for helping me get set up electronically. Hello and greetings. Um, I'm very pleased um, to welcome you to the viewing of the best of the best for 2019. Um, these represent petroglyphs that our recorders have recorded on Mesa Prieta on private land. Um, this land is closed to the public. Um, land ownership permission is needed in order to uh, go on these land parcels. And so this is a special privilege that we have um, because you would not be able to see these images without us presenting them here. So I'd like to draw your attention to this first image on the, bowl, on the um, uh, slide. Um, there are three snakes um, depicted at the, the joint juncture of these two large boulders. The top one to the left is a one-horned serpent, um, an avanu, which we see a lot on the mesa. The one-horned serpent we, we see maybe um, not quite as often as a two-horned serpent, but they are there. The second image, and I'll use my pointer, is a two-horned serpent. Not quite as well made, but you can see the horns here um, as he's descending down the rock. And then over here on the right is another snake, and I can't determine if that's a one or a two-horned serpent. Um, it's very common for these serpents to be um, in the proximity of cracks, of holes, um, of the edge of the rock, as though they were emerging. So what I'm going to be showing you tonight is about 20% of 300 loci or boulders that we recorded in 2019. We recorded about a thousand elements or individual petroglyphs about, and we identified about 30 outstanding panels. We took over 300 photos and uh, when all was said and done, we recorded 80 acres on the Cook family property and 25 acres on other parcels. In this photo, um, we have kind of a wedge shaped rock and the maker of this image um, fit, it, fit the image very, very nicely on the end of the rock. We believe it's a, um, a war hammer. Um, it's very nicely made. It's fully impact. Um, you, if you look closely, you can see that there is black lichen interlaced uh, throughout the image. Very, very nice image, but made nicer by the placement on the rock. This photo was taken by one of our recorders who happened to be flying back from Denver. And he looked down and lo, there was the mesa and he was able to provide this um, photo for us. So you can see the shape of the mesa. Um, our work is primarily over here on the east side, which is the Rio Grande Valley. We have done some work over here on the, on the west side um, in the, Ojo, the Rio Ojo Caliente Valley, but this side is very, very steep and access is very, very difficult. We've done a little bit of work on the top of the mesa. Um, the mesa was formed about three million years ago when um, lava ran down from um, fissures up by the Colorado border. The lava field ran down and flowed into what was then a valley at the base of the San Sangre de Cristo Mountains, about a thousand feet higher than it is now. Uh, the lava hardened and it formed about a hundred foot thick cap, um, which was then um, heavily eroded on both sides. Erosion um, formed the Rio Grande Valley starting from up in Colorado and erosion formed the Rio Ojo Caliente Valley. And 
when all was said and done three million years later, we have a mesa standing 1,000 feet higher than, the, than what was the valley floor three million years ago. From the work that we have done and from our colleagues uh, who have worked on the mesa, we know that human usage goes back over 7,500 years, and I'll be talking a little bit about that. The Mesa Prieta project was founded by Catherine Wells in 1999. Catherine and her partner Lloyd Dennis moved to the Mesa in, in 1992 and purchased a piece of land of about 188 acres and immediately Catherine recognized that there were thousands of images on this property. Not only were they petroglyph images but they were world-class petroglyph images and she very quickly uh, started a plan of trying to determine how to protect these images in this land. Um, the petroglyph recording project evolved starting formally in 2002. Uh, we, had, we were fortunate to have uh, some of the founders of petroglyph recording in New Mexico help us, uh, the Karates and the Brodies, who uh, were from the um, Arc Society of New Mexico and started the Rock Art Field School. Um, to date, we have recorded well over 61,000 petroglyphs. Think about that. We anticipate there are over 100,000 images on the Mesa. We have a long way to go, and the work will likely exceed the group that is working now. Mesa Prieta has been identified as the largest petroglyph site in New Mexico. It's larger than Three Rivers. It's larger than um, National Monument down in Albuquerque. It's a phenomenal site, and most of it is on private land. We want to give thanks to the Richard Cook family and to six other private landowners on Mesa Prieta for allowing us to record petroglyphs and other archaeological features on their land. Um, it, it, it took a while uh, for us to get the private landowners to give us permission to record, but now it's, um, it's so easy. People are... Um, embrace having us come onto their property. They know that we're not going to violate property rights and we're not going to violate uh, issues like the location of petroglyphs, photos, etc. They're not going to have photos on their land pop up on Facebook. We respect their rights. This little image, um, uh, Kaz and her group who are watching, hi Kaz, um, recorded this. Um, we're not sure if it's a human or if it's a brand. Um, it does have what could be hands, it could have a head, and it could have feet. Um, so we're not sure what, what was intended by the maker, and because we weren't there when it was made, we will never know. Our adult volunteers are the heart of the recording program. Right now we have 31 volunteers recording in nine teams on the Mesa. We have five teams recording on two parcels of the Cook property, Two other teams are working on separate private parcels, and one survey team called the RATS, the Rock Art Trekkers, work as assigned. Um, our number has stayed right around 25 to 40 volunteers. Um, we've been so fortunate um, to have our volunteers come to us and stay with us. We, the volunteers undergo a minimum of five days of classroom and mentored field training prior to being assigned to a recording team on the Mesa, and this is mandatory. We don't give this any slack. The next point, we believe that the credibility of our data depends on the quality of work produced by our recording volunteers. If we get poor data, inaccurate data, bad measurements, bad locational data, um, we're not going to go back in the field again to re-record these images. We have so much work to do. This is a one-time situation. And so we stress to our volunteers, do the best you can. Give us the best work that is possible for you. Volunteers commit to recording one day a month for a minimum of one year. And this is kind of a payback uh, for all of the time that is spent training them. And um, we know that life happens and some volunteers have had to drop out but generally not. Several volunteers have been with the project for 15 or more years. And I have to stress again, this work would not be possible without our recording and survey volunteers. They are amazing. Um, this is a schematic of the land ownership of the Mesa. The north end of the Mesa in green is owned by the BLM. And um, early on, 
Catherine and Paul Williams and Dr. Richard Ford uh, formed a pact to start the Summer Youth Intern Program. And they recorded, uh, and I'll talk about this more in a minute, they recorded areas on the BLM land um, during the Summer Summer Youth Program. This is the original Cook property. This is 4,000 acres uh, that we received permission to record on in 2009. Right now, I've got five teams assigned to working in here. We've completed about 53%. 53% is all um, in, in 11 years. Down here, this is the Cook Cochran property that Mr. Cook purchased, and we got permission to record here in about 20... 12 2013 and we've got two, the summer youth program works down here and we have two teams working um, on this parcel of property this is the el huique mine which is still an active mine we do have a, a pleasant partnership with the owner and manager of the mine and they are very very supportive of our project and extremely supportive of the summer youth intern program um, this bright pink is the Ancone block, which is a cluster of small properties. We have one team still working in there, and they told me they're going to finish up in, in one or two more trips out. The Wells Petroglyph Preserve is here. And to give you a perspective, this is 170-some acres now, um, having been reduced with um, land donations. So you can get the perspective of those of you who have been on the preserve and appreciate its vastness as to all the rest that's up here. The Salazar property is the property we recorded early on and uh, we've just been given permission to go back and kind of clean up our work a little bit. And I have one team working there. They've, they've made two visits and they'll be, they'll be working there for quite a while. Um, the summer youth intern program um, is made up of generally of youth age 13 to 18 who have to apply for 12 openings in the program. We've been able to vary the number of slots. Um, we've been up to, I think, 16 a youth, depending on how many adult mentors that we can get to be with the youth. This year, uh, because of COVID, um, Chester reduced it to, I believe, four youth and did a very intense, um, wonderful program for those four kids. The kids are trained to record petroglyphs and other archeological features in the same manner as the adult recording team. They don't get five days of intense training. They get one day of intense training, but then they are mentored in the field for every day that they are there. They work uh, for two weeks on the Cook property. And as I mentioned, they're working down here, very rugged area. Um, we picked all the low hanging apples. It's tough to get in there, tough to get out of there. They work for two weeks every June. Uh, they're overseen by our project archaeologist, Chester Wash, and adult volunteers. And summer youth is STEM-based. The youth acquire skills that contribute to employment and advanced education. The last day of their program, they spend um, in a computer lab doing data entry. So they're learning skills that will help them to move on to employment. This is a photo of the summer youth program for 2019. Uh, with all of the adult mentors included. It was a good, it was a big crowd that year. And these are candid shots of the kids working in the field. A team consists of three or more people. And then there is always an adult mentor with a team. Uh, this is Allison Youngs, uh, who's been with the program for six or seven years now. Um, they, uh, you can see how rugged this, this uh, terrain is. Um, and the adults are working in the same kind of terrain. They have to climb up from the bottom of the mesa. There's not many trails, so they have to make their way. And you can see, they smile. <laughs> um, I'm going to get, make my presentation based on time periods rather than land ownership as I have in the past. And so I just wanna go over this slide with you. The archaic period is the oldest known period of, that we have um, become aware of on the mesa through our own work and through other researchers. It started at about 5,500 before Common Era, which is about 7,500 years ago, and continued until 500 Common Era, which is about 500 AD. The archaic people were hunters and gatherers. They, they were in mobile bands. They moved through this area foraging for wild plants, hunting game animals, and also um, 
um, obtaining materials to sustain them, such as uh, rock material for their tools. The images that they made were very deeply packed, heavily, and are now heavily or totally repatinated and very difficult to see. They are called representational. Um, they're abstract, geometric images, very simple in images um, of what they imagined at that time. Asterisks, curvilinear meanders, joined diamonds or triangles, and other geometric images. They were most often placed on the tops of boulders or on the north side. Many are extremely abstract and perhaps were made by a person or shaman in a dreamlike ceremonial or hallucinogenic trance. Some of these we just don't even try to understand. The images placed in the later archaic period include human footprints and handprints, as well as animal tracks. Archaic images are the oldest images recognized as pre at present on the Mesa. We do not know what Paleo-Indian images look like, but are researching. So my first slide of archaic geometric images is what we have, what we categorize as a one-fold ladder. Um, you can see there is a single line. It's a little crooked. It comes down uh, the entire length of the image, and then there are cross lines going across. A geometric pattern, a very, very simple pattern that we see very often with the archaic images. I've my board and our photo. known as a PDS sheet. You can see on the mud board, um, we've identified, these are, these are, are universal um, for identification to our project. We have the name of our project. The 002 is a number assigned to the landowner. So it's the project landowner's number, uh, the date, um, the section or provenience uh, within that property which is 15 in this one, and the photo number. These two numbers relate to the um, Lab of Anthropology. Our, our data is submitted to them uh, for archival storage, and these, these are their um, numbers uh, that identify us as a project and this land as a, um, par a land parcel. Over here on the photo data sheet, um, we have again those same numbers as, as here, so it's all tied together. I have erased the name of the landowner and I've erased the uh, locational information for protection uh, for the landowners. The information that is collected uh, by our recorders is uh, the, the phone number. We, have, we assign a letter to each boulder. Uh, they take a directional reading. They take metric measurements of the height, the width, and what we call the above ground level um, which is very helpful because if you have a boulder three feet high, it's helpful to know that that petroglyph is sitting about two meters off the ground, or it might be sitting about uh, half a meter off the ground. It helps us to go back and to be able to find it again. We have a category sheet uh, that we, we fit these images into, and then we have re record characteristics such as a repatination, how they were made, if it was pecked, and if they were pecked, if it's relief pecking, dense pecking, just medium pecking, or light. Whether it was scratched or braided. Um, and then we don't, we only have found one painted petroglyph on the mesa so far. And then the category is listed and then other additional items. You notice uh, with this petroglyph, those little black dots are black lichen. They may have been attracted to this image because it's a little deeper image because it's so deeply pecked. And there may have been a little bit more moisture in this image to attract the growth of lichen. So in this column, it says additionals. It says N6. And that tells us that, that's there, that there is lichen growing within the petroglyph. Then the drawing itself. Um, it's so important to have a good drawing. Very often the photo is not as good as this one. Very often the photo might be blurred or it, the, the image just does not pop out of these black rocks. And so it's very, very important for the recorder to give us as good a drawing as possible. And it's interesting when I start with new recorders, um, very often uh, people will say, I, don't want, to, I want, don't want to have to draw, I can't draw. But it turns out that the people who say they can't draw often do the best job 
with documenting these images. They, um, people who are artists, so to speak, um, may want to improve on it a little bit, just, you know, elaborate a little bit. What we want is the meat of the petroglyph, and that's what we have here. Uh, these images, um, very, very dark, very hard to see. I, in Photoshop, I lightened this up a little bit, and it didn't help very much, but it might help you to see the, the images. This is a small boulder that has cracked in half, and on this side, there is the essence of a one-pulled ladder that is in the drawing down here, that you can see. It goes off the edge in several places, and we make a note about that, an S2 indicating that the image has gone off to the edge of the rock. This one has more of crisscross lines, they're very, very deep, and with time, with six, seven thousand years, they have totally repatinated, so they're very hard to see. Um, our recorders have to have have to develop their eye to be able to see these images. It's better in the morning or in the evening when the sun is shining across the boulders, and there may be a little shadow along these very deep, recessed pecking marks. But um, it's, it's, it's something they have to learn. They have to be able to look at these boulders and look for an irregularity that tells them that there might be an image on them. Again, we have the photo, photo mug board on both of these. This image is not quite as old and not as heavily repatinated, but the style tells us that it was likely made in the archaic period, time period. This is a relatively small boulder. And the maker of the petroglyph started with pecking a very densely uh, pecked line along the spine of the rock. And then they made a, a series of joined circles or joined uh, diamonds or rectangles coming down. And then put a, a horizontal lines going out to the side. Um, all very deep, all very evenly, deeply pecked. And our recorder has done a very nice job of duplicating what we have seen on the rock. Um, and uh, categorizing it over here. Now you might notice these light dots on here. These may or may not be human made. It may have been made by another rock falling down or gravel falling down, but the recorder has documented those in this drawing and also um, it actually put it down as recent spalling just so, so that we know looking at the photo that um, at the time that this drawing was made, that those that spalling or those peckings were, were present. Another one, not quite as dark, um, but again, a, an archaic iconography or pattern, a geometric pattern of joined rectangles and lines. Um, one little wavy line in here, but all joined together, all very deeply pecked and replicated very nicely by the uh, recorder over here. This one, um, your eye is immediately brought to this light um, slash on the rock. This is human made and it was made probably not too many hundreds of years ago. But if you look more closely as the recorders did, they were able to discern the circular image here. And if they looked even closer, they determined that this was an elk track and that it had dew claws. So they recorded it as such, um, as a very, it's a, a, a relief pecking, very heavily repatinated and um, recorded it as such. And then they noticed another number of other peckings that were made during the same time period. Then hundreds or maybe thousands of years later, Somebody came along and put this mark on it, maybe or maybe not knowing that these earlier um, images were there. The later person also did some random pecking. And this is all documented on our sheet uh, by our recorders. You can see a very, very thorough recording over here. Um, and again, the drawing and the description of what the recorder saw replicating what is hard to see on this boulder. This was a boulder uh, that experienced a lot of water runoff that smoothed the rock and polished it. Um, the, the first thing our eye kept caught was these two circular holes that may have been made by a pebble that um, fell in these holes that was swirled around and around and around when the water um, rushed over it. And we see that in the Southwest 
generally with sandstone, no, though not hard basalt. There are 11 footprints carved in this boulder. They are all outlined, and I believe all of them are human footprints. And you can see on the drawing, uh, they all have enough toes. Sometimes we have too many toes, such as this one down here and this one down here. There's only one that is infilled, and it's right down here on the base. One I'm wondering is, could this be a bear track? It's quite a bit wider. It could be a bear track. Uh, there are some circles, some double circles, and um, I thought there was a cupula on here, but I don't see it. So very hard to see. Um, recorders have to get down on their hands and knees, touch the rock, even though we're told not to touch the petroglyphs. We touch these with our fingers so that we can, like Braille, we can figure out what's on the rock. Um, this next one is also of human footprints, but of a very different nature. Um, the footprints are totally infilled, densely pecked, and they're not quite as deep. They're, they're just densely pecked. They all have the same, the correct number of toes, which, and I mention that because we get a lot of four-toed foot feet and six-toed feet, as well as finger hands. So, and look how <clears throat> the repatination has made um, the images almost the same color as the boulder. <clears throat> this is a, such a remarkable image, a remarkable rock, a remarkable locus. This very likely was identified as a shrine by the early people, and this was not made in one sitting. People came back again and again and again to create what is on this surface. There are 31 cupules. Um, here, all going all the way around, 31 cupules. And I'm sure most of you know what a cupule is. They, um, we, we describe them as a ceremonial feature that is, is made worldwide. Um, they go from the very oldest time periods to today. In Hawaii, they are still made um, as part of our ritual for, for birth. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the dust emitted from the grinding and pounding of these cupules is thought to be have ceremonial purposes. And that's about as far as we want to go. Um, if you notice, there's a handprint here and there's a footprint up at the top. And look at the toes of this foot, that each one of those toes is a cupule, very tiny one. This nucleated circle at the top has a very large cupule as the nucleus. Some of the cupules, like this one is just beginning, others are very, very deep. So our recorders, um, in an instance like this, will take um, measurements of the cupules across, as far as the diameter and the depth as, as well as they can and document that. And they'll try to collect as much information on an image like this um, to document on our photo data sheet so that the researcher uh, will have that data uh, when they have the opportunity to, to look at this um, at this work. Now, the other thing that's noteworthy about this boulder, and we'll see more of this in, in one that's coming in a little bit, is that there has been a lot of pounding on the surface, pounding the patina off of this boulder so that it does not have all of its original um, surface or patina. And um, that is, we, we have named that ceremonial pounding. We feel it's intentional and we part, we feel that it's um, integral to the making of what we think are shrines. This is just an amazing feature. Um, it's not very big, but it's just an amazing feature. This little <clears throat> locus was found up at the north end of our properties. And again, it's archaic. It has a, a footprint with an undeterminate number of toes. They just were not made very well over here. This turned out to be an oval. However, you can see that inner line that, you know, it may be a flower pattern, we're not sure, but uh, it was recorded just as an infilled oval. And this interesting figure, we're wondering if that could be a plant form. It could be a yucca um, with, the, with the yucca leaves sticking up and the roots. The yucca is a very important plant to the Native American people. 
Um, the, 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 the leaves are used for making things such as moccasins and weaving things such as cordage. And then of course the root and the fruit are edible products. So it's a very, very important product or plant for the Native American people. And then down here, hard to see, are two little baby feet. And these were half buried. And so uh, the recorder um, uncovered those, but these are, they're like, they're so small, they're like an infant feet. And it does have the proper number of toes, but very, very carefully made and must have had some very specific meaning. Now, <coughs> our recorder, Allison Youngs, found this, and she was so excited that she photographed it with her phone and sent it out to a group of us. It turns out that this is a size 12 foot, big foot, um, arch late archaic, um, relief pecking, solid pecking, beautifully made, and especially the toes. You notice the, the uh, pecking on the toes, how carefully crafted those are. So this, um, Alice is in, is in a team with Kaz, Kathy, Beth, and Bob. And um, they found this one and looked, it was at the end of the day and they looked around and found, they were in a cluster of wonderful images. So they went back and they were looking at an image, oops, sorry, an image um, here. And Kathy looked down and thought, she was about to sit on this rock and she thought, oops, I better not. <clears throat> and so um, they, Kathy got up, and then uh, they went ahead and recorded this, and this is what they found. So this is, a, as you can see, a highly polished rock. It has uh, three primary images on it. The one here in the upper left is a human footprint. It has five toes, and it's interesting because the toes are very splayed. The heel is very narrow. Um, on the right is a beautifully made handprint. Again, uh, the pecking is very, very rough inside of this highly polished rock. So they're, they're not easy to see. They're easy to feel and to know that there is something <clears throat> that has been made there. And then this one down here um, was a little hard to discern. We're not certain if this was meant to be another footprint or what. It seemed to be unfinished. And then at a later date, maybe a couple thousand years later, someone came along and put this tailed disc over the top of this feature. Um, so that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, which you know brought the appearance of petroglyphs on this rock uh, to be more prominent, because you can see here that this would be the first thing that you would see. But careful looking, careful uh, research of looking at this rock brings out these other features. One of the last boulders that they recorded in this uh, little cluster was <clears throat> this rock with very deeply scratched lines going across horizontally. And then what makes it more obvious is that it received some abrasion at a later time, either human made or uh, made by the abrasion of a rock. What is noteworthy about this is looking at these scratches is that they are repatinated all the way to the base of these very deep scratches. And it made us think, what time period was this made? Um, we work, we have, we have toured with a man named Larry Lorendorf, who is an expert on paleo images. And um, he has indicated to us that lines, parallel lines are um, a, a frequent iconography of the paleo images. So we, I asked the team to record this. We have it in our files. Um, it's well described down here. Scratches totally repatinated with abrasions, superimposed, suspect cultural time period to be early archaic or before, two applications separated, a considerable amount of time and separation. So the, the um, abrasion and the scratching, we feel is made, there's a considerable amount of time period in between. This will go in our database and it will be available for researchers. <clears throat> and then this one I put in, um, if you can see it, you're pretty good. I lightened it up here in Photoshop. And what you see is um, what looks like a modern image. To me it does, um, with a pin going through a rectangle. But you can see that it's totally repatinated. 
So this fool's our eye more often than not that a totally repatinated image is not archaic. The iconography of this image is not an archaic image. Um, and so we have to be open-minded that um, we don't know what time period this fits in, but uh, we're quite certain it's not archaic, even though it's very, very darkly repatinated. And all of that is in the notes um, for the researcher to observe. So um, let's see, Ethan, are there any questions I need to address? All right, Candy. So uh, we have several questions. Um, none of them are specific to the archaic period, but um, if you want, we can we can go through them now. Well, why don't we hear what they are? Okay. All right. So uh, we've got a few comments as well. So Margaret says, what an amazing amount of work. Thanks for helping protect these. And uh, Kathy asks, do you use D-stretch? Good question, Kathy. Um, I believe that chest, that's a goal of Chester's. We have not started to use it, but we need to. Good question. And for, uh, for listeners out there that aren't familiar with D-Stretch, uh, it's a, a program that edits images and changes the, the coloration and, and tones around so it can help uh, to better see uh, petroglyphs and pictographs from photographs. Uh, Lori Waters asks, do you record GPS information for each petroglyph? Yes. Um, Lori, the, the, um, the, the boulder is called a locus, and the locus receives a single GPS reading, regardless of it, whether it's a tiny little rock or if it's a boulder six meters long. It receives a single GPS reading. And uh, Kathy comments, I think if six toes, it signifies spirit world and five toes, earthly world. I like that. <laughs> I do know that there is some uh, archeological evidence from footprints and plaster and, and a few other things that there actually were, um, you know, individuals within the, the indigenous populations that had more than five toes, so. Um, all right, and we've got another comment from Amy, and she says, those beautiful geometric lines almost look like a map. I have to say something about Amy. She is um, a um, collection specialist at the OAS property in Santa Fe, and uh, she's, she's working on a team that I'll be talking about in a little bit, but uh, I listen very closely very carefully when Amy speaks. <laughs> Great. And then uh, Colin asks, uh, do we have any idea why this mesa attracted so many petroglyphs? Oh my, that's a long answer to that question. Obviously, um, the Rio Grande at the eastern base, um, there were several pueblos, Fioge on the east side and several pueblos over on the Ojo Caliente side of the Tewa people who settled here in about uh, 1100 AD and, and lived here until the time of contact. Um, and so, yes, we can tie, we, we feel that the images for the ancestral Pueblo period, which I'm gonna be talking about now, uh, was occurred during that time. For the ancestral period, um, there are on the ranges on either side of us, there are quarries of obsidian um, hunting here. So hunter-gatherers, would have been attracted to coming up here. A lot of natural resources were available to the people. Awesome. And so we have two more questions before we let you continue. Um, Gary asks, are these records online to view? No, they're not. Um, the only way these can be viewed is to become an, an accepted and approved researcher with the project. Um, and then they would be available uh, to that person. Uh, they are not all of, an overview of the records are at ARMS, the Archaeological Research Management section in Santa Fe. And again, people who are screened would have access to the records. All right, this is part of the protection we give to landowners. 
And uh, Helene asks, what's the scale on the photo number sign? Um, that is um, uh, 30 centimeters. So it's about 15 inches for the board. Okay, so that looks like about all the questions we have right now. So I think you can go ahead and continue. Okay, so the next cultural time period is the ancestral cultural time period. And this represents um, the time period in which images were made, uh, represents about 75% of the images that we find on the Mesa were made during this time period. It started about 800 AD or Common Era and ended at the time of contact with the Spanish, which I'll be talking about in a bit, in 1598. Um, the people, about 1200 um, CE, the ancestral Tewa people came from the Four Corners area. They're the ancestors of the Tewa-speaking people who live in the Pueblos here today. Um, there's a lot of discussion about the evolution from archaic to ancestral Pueblo. Um, you know, what delineates uh, that, that evolution? And the best answer we can give is that people began, as they were hunter-gatherers, they began to actually cultivate some of the plants they needed for food and personal medicinal use. And this was not necessary in, necessarily in their place of living, but in a place in the field that they would cultivate um, plants and then come back and collect them. And this evolved um, to become a more organized um, <clears throat> activity and finally moved into the people having their living place and their cultivation place in the same place. So at that, and also I'd like to point out that the archaic period uh, evolution is not uniform across the United States or across the world. Um, it, it, is, it is pinpointed to the time that they began to cultivate uh, the plants that they needed. So in down towards Albuquerque, there is a cave that Dr. Ford excavated and he, he found corn and he felt that the archaic period began to evolve about 600 CE. Uh, up here, I think the period is a little bit later. So the images in the ancestral Pueblo cultural period were largely representational, meaning that we could identify them. They look like things that we see in the world today. They include mythological one and two horned serpents, which are water beings, spirals, circles and discs, concentric circles, anthropomorphic figures, humans, ceremonial objects, shields, stars, flute players, animals, birds, dancers, ceremonial figures, etc. Exciting images. So my first image um, actually has the iconography of an, of an archaic image with the joined diamonds, joined circles, and then the, zig, the parallel zigzag lines. However, the repatination is very light. And so I'd have a very hard time placing this in a time period. And down here, on the right, lower right, this could be a sandal track, but I'm not sure. Another human footprint, but obviously the repatination is much lighter. So this is probably early ancestral Pueblo. Uh, please note on this footprint that this guy may have a broken toe. We're not sure, but it doesn't look um, very natural. The mythological images make <clears throat> play a big part in the ancestral Pueblo iconography. And probably the most dominant of those images are the serpents or the Avanus. These are two horned serpents um, on private land. And these were recorded by um, Susan and Kathy. <clears throat> this beautiful serpent uh, is not very heavily picked but you can see how perfectly he is picked. He is, he is coming out of a crack or a hole in the rock. And this is very common that the serpents are shown emerging, perhaps from the underworld, from a hole, a crack, or the edge of a boulder. And in the area where this serpent was recorded, um, there are phenomenal images of serpents. It's close to the Rio Grande. We're not very far up the slope from the Rio Grande. Then here's another two-horned serpent, another two-horned serpent, and then a snake, and another snake, and then a turtle. 
These are all water images. The turtle is not mythological, but certainly the two horned serpents are. They represent water, fertility, um, and they're very, very important to the ancestral people. This image to the right has a two horned serpent and then something coming off to the, to the right. And I, we don't know if that's another serpent head or what that represents, but we find this image <clears throat> fairly often in our recording. And this wavy line could be a snake, it could be a wavy line. Down here, another two horned serpent and notice the difference in the heads. You know, this one has a very pronounced rounded head. This one has a rounded head, but the emphasis is on the long horns. A long serpentine body. And then up here, another two horned serpent, but then at the other end, also a two horned head, serpent head. So the people took quite a bit of liberty in documenting these images. This one over here, I didn't have a good picture um, photo of, um, but again, a beautifully made serpent. Uh, this is the boulder. And so this serpent is filling the entire boulder and then the pecking of it just kind of dwindles away and down to the base of the boulder. <coughs> One horned serpents are also in the mythological category. This is as beautiful a one-horned serpent as we've seen. Um, he's, he's facing upward, his mouth is open, and he, his body goes down right to the edge of the rock. He's emerging from the edge of the rock. This is a very nice drawing that was made depicting this serpent and also showing the size of the boulder that he was put on. This one, I don't know who drew this one. This one is a Kathy and um, Susan one of the one horned serpent kind of coming off the edge of the rock and coming down this way. So we record probably one tenth as many one horned serpents as we do two horned serpents. They're not as common on the Mesa. However, the further south you go, I believe that the one horned serpent becomes more um, frequently observed. Both are myth mythological, both, both are very, very important. This is an interesting image with a one horn, I mean, a two horned serpent going up here, um, a, a snake or a wavy line here. And then this, um, we're not, this is, we believe, mythological. We, we see this figure in a number of places the circle and then this, these objects coming up here. Sometimes it has uh, what appears to be legs and feet, sometimes arms, sometimes it's, it has an eye appearing feature. Um, but we've seen this repeated a number of times and have sort of moved it to the mythological um, category because it doesn't represent anything that is um, <clears throat> of normal life. Now, um, this is a big boulder that uh, was recorded and uh, we're very, we train and ask our recorders to take close-ups of, of images that are very, very nice or just with a big boulder like this to take close-ups of various parts of the rock so that we can make them out more clearly uh, in, the, um, in the study of them. So this one, they took a close-up of and by golly, it looks like a rabbit. And there are people among us in our project that don't believe that we have rabbit um, images on the Mesa, but here we are. Um, we also have a turtle on this rock. Um, this has been, uh, anyway, this has been very carefully documented to show that uh, this mammal uh, does exist. We move into anthropomorphs, which is another very large category of images that we record on the Mesa. Um, and ceremonial figures are among the most dominant of that category. <clears throat> so here we have three images. Um, this one is totally infilled, has likely a feather headdress, has outstretched hands, has an object in this hand probably, and then has this curious line coming across the torso. We know that the Hopi were here prior to the Pueblo revolt. And the, one of the Hopi dances is the snake dance. We have images on the Wales Preserve of what we feel are snake dancers. And I 
question, is this, does this represent a snake dancer? We have no way of knowing. Uh, we have no way of questioning the maker. But that is, um, that is on the data sheet and, uh, you know, can be left for researchers to decide. His accompanying figure on the rock is a person that has a face. And this is unusual in the ancestral Pueblo um, iconography. Generally, faces belong more on the um, post-contact uh, images. This one appears to have a nice feather headdress on the side and uh, an ear adornment. And note the interesting uh, mid-calf garment that both of these figures are wearing. <clears throat> on the right side is another ceremonial figure shown with nice a feather headdress, ear adornment, um, a square torso, feet and hands, a large hand, and then this hand um, has a large hoop. Now, there's no way of knowing is this a hoop, for, as in a hoop dancer, is this a shield, um, is this a squash? We have no way of knowing what that is, but it's an extremely curious um, feature of this drawing. And then you can see these vertical lines that have come down and we feel what happened was another boulder slid down the front of this, um, making that very striking pattern. Another ceremonial image. Um, this one is a uh, infilled figure with very large oversized hands that very, very likely could be indicative of power. Um, he has, his face has eyes in the relief. He has a single feather. He is accompanied on this rock by two two-horned serpents. We have no way of knowing if they were applied at the same time, but they certainly add to the power of this person. And on this side, um, we have a two-horned serpent and have, I think, a face or a mask with a very elaborate feather headdress. This boulder, a very busy boulder, and this was um, recorded by, Ka no, this is Kathy and Susan's team, um, has this figure here as a centerpiece, which could be su is suggestive of a birthing figure. However, there's no evidence of a fetus or a placenta being emerged, but the stature, the squat of this, of this um, <clears throat> feature is very similar to the traditional birthing positions that women take in the table world. She is holding what appears to be a trifoil of perhaps pine boughs. We're not sure what that is. Above her head is a, a bird, very well-made bird that may be called a knife wing, which is a mythological bird uh, that ex exists in the Tewa iconography. And it's supposed to be a bird that gives tremendous power. And also um, the nice thing about this bird is that he tends to um, calm unruly children. Um, there's also some um, crosses here, equilateral star, um, equilateral crosses that could be stars. The Venus star is very sacred to the uh, Tewa people and um, that iconography is often applied, especially on fertility features. And then up here we have what appears to be a tailed disc. So look how carefully the recorder has um, recorded all of this, documented all of this, all of the pecking up here, every little mark on here is recorded and categorized. This nice little friendly guy down here uh, is probably later day, it might be more in the post contact period because due to the lightened, I could lightened repatination, but a very casual feather headdress, one-handed wave, maybe it's a one-handed power signal, but um, very casual little guy. And then Susan and Kathy found this one down in an arroyo, um, a very, very nicely made, obviously male figure. There is no indication of a head ever having been intact and of course, no explanation as to why he does not have a head. And Kathy and Susan um, recorded this also in the same arroyo, a very small um, flute player um, with all the essential components. He has a feather headdress. He has his flute. He has his two hands holding the flute. He has a humpback. He's phallic. He's walking. 
But the interesting thing about him is he has a cupule for a head. And there is another cupule over here. Again, Kathy and Susan, um, this boulder, it's a very, it's quite a large boulder, and it, it just stands on its own, and um, the image is visible from a, a good distance because it's so obvious. The four nucleated circles are deeply pecked, and they're very uniform. The circles are very uniform, and the size of the four nucleated circles is very uniform. But when they came up to record it, they found that there's other circles. There's a, a later day raid circle. There's more circles over here. And all of those are very, very carefully documented in their sheet. <clears throat> this is a collection of raid circles or sunbursts um, that have been taken from boulders with a lot of other things on them. These two were on boulders that were about two meters apart. And I can't help but think that they might, this might be a copycat of this one. Um, notice that uh, there seems to be a foot. There's definitely a foot on this one. But this one, which I think is latter day, does have a face. Then these others have waving uh, lines coming from their spirals. Beautifully made, very carefully made, very intentionally made. This little boulder um, I put in here, it has a, a wonderful grid pattern on it. But the thing of note to me was if this board is 15 inches tall, this, this um, boulder is about six inches tall by about 10 inches. And to me, it speaks portable Petro. And so we realize that part of our work is, we know that our work is to protect, not just document, to but to protect the images. And if this boulder ever disappears, which it could, we have a good record of it in our records. This one, Kaz's team uh, found Kaz and Kathy and Allison and Beth and Bob. I don't know if they were all there that day. Um, we think it's a shield. Um, we're not sure. Uh, it's, um, it's not that big. It's about 12 inches in diameter. Very uh, beautifully made. And then look over here at these very carefully made arrows coming out. There's four, almost five of these arrows coming out. And then these three aren't quite as developed. And then the very fine interior of what might be a shield. It's heavily repatinated, but its iconography indicates that it's ancestral Pueblo. And then please notice that there's a lighter pecking, that someone came along hundreds of years later and decided that they need to repeck it. And so this is something that the recording team will note on their sheet, that there has been um, latter-day repecking on this on this. Um, image. It's a gorgeous image. They don't have to be huge to be gorgeous. So this one is um, a striking ancestral Pueblo image and it's um, the feature, fe the feature central figure is this beautiful two-horned serpent coming down to the edge of the rock. A lovely turtle, another turtle, a possible knife wing up here, a lovely disc with a worked in a natural hole in it. And this I'm not sure about it's, if it's meant to be um, a cross on a structure or what that's meant to be. It's very likely um, post contact in nature. And then please notice all of this pecking all over the rock. That is not random, that is intentional. And we, we when we see this, um, we note that it's there and, uh, and and name it as we call it ritual pecking. Uh, we feel that it was placed there intentionally by the makers of these images. So why don't I go ahead, Ethan, and get questions in a bit. Um, so the next time period, uh, we call the historic cultural time period or post contact. And significantly, this is, is specific to the date of CE 1598 with the Spanish that came and, and, and uh, established a colony at the south end of the Mesa in Oka Iwinge. Um, they came with their horses, donkeys, cattle, riders on the horses, cowboys, oxen, carts, crosses, guns, churches, etc. 
and later in the historic period, names, dates, and initials it came with all of this. The Tema people began first to make images of features in the Spanish culture, and we think that the first they noted was the horse, um, a creature they had never seen before. They quickly recognized the power that the horse enabled a man to have. And some of the early drawings that we find on the rocks of horses are not anatomically correct. The legs are bending the wrong way. Um, the rider's feet are dragging on the ground, but they, the people rushed to get an um, image of these extraordinary um, features. Later on, the images were made both by Tewa and later the Spanish. And these features are the only ones that are time specific and related to what the Spanish introduced into the area because of that date. Um, <clears throat> this is another small boulder, um, a busy little boulder that upon examination shows three human figures that appear to be dancing. You can see his leg is bent, uh, he's kicking um, tiny little figures of colonial people. This one <clears throat> is wonderful. It's of a woman uh, in a, a dress. She has a cocked, a cocked little hat or bonnet. Uh, she has a petticoat under her skirt. She has heeled shoes or boots that, that she's ready to tap with. And then her uh, partner could be a child. We're not sure if this child is leaping in the air. We're not sure what this figure is. But um, obviously a, a historic figure that um, shows action and intent. It was interesting when this was recorded, we found a World War I canteen at the base of this boulder and per the request of the landowner, we left it in place. Here is another colonial woman uh, with a, a widespread skirt and she appears to have pantaloons with one foot down and perhaps the other foot kicked behind her and she's holding a cross aloft. This image was recorded by the Summer Youth Kids, um, and it's it's suggestive of being a human. And uh, we put when we categorized it, we we categorized it as such. Um, it possibly could have a head and a torso, and feet and legs and hands that are almost wing-like. It's beautifully made, um, very precise, very deeply pecked, and the kids did a very very good job of uh, recording it. This one goes back to Kaz's team. These two images were close together, and this one you saw earlier in the program that could be a brand or it could be a human. This one is more clearly a human with a well-defined head, well-defined large hands, a penis, and, and uh, feet with big boots on it. These are small images. The summer youth kids did this one, and we didn't know in categorizing it, are these crosses, are these humans, or are they crossed lines? Uh, we have no way of knowing, um, but it's again, it's a beautifully made image, and the kids did a wonderful job of recording it. The kids also, the summer youth kids also recorded this boulder. It's three and a third meters tall, okay? And at per protocol, they took photos of um, a third of the boulder so that we have good photos of each third of the boulder and then made an overall drawing. I believe there are 11 crosses on the boulder and some of them are T-shaped and we don't know if the T-shape is supposed to represent a cross or if it has other meaning um, but we have documented as such. And then down here Jose um, is at the spelling H-O-Z-E, J-O-Z-E, or is that a backwards S? We, we don't know. But again, the kids did a very, very nice job of accurately documenting what was on this folder. They're good. They had the treat, again, some of you have had the treat of um, recording this image of could what could be a disconso, we're not certain. We found other uh, images in the area that other archeologists have called disconsos. And it does demonstrate some of the different kinds of European crosses that uh, are found on the Mesa. These three on the top are pomé crosses with the, with the knobs on the ends of the um, projections. Uh, this one is a St. John's cross. And this could be a church. 
we're not sure. Um, but look at what look what a nice drawing that, that the kids did in documenting this image. This one is a much more somber image to me um, of five crosses of different sizes. We don't know what this represents. I hope it's not a family. Um, the, um, the crosses are on some kind of a structure. We don't know if it's a church or what this is. Again, the kids did a very nice job of documenting accurately what they saw on the boulders. And then this one is another um, collection of crosses. These are patriarchal crosses with the two bars. We have several of them there. These, they're also um, sitting on an altar. We have a base. And then down here, these are Latin crosses. Again, very carefully documented by the summer youth kids. This one um, was recorded some time ago. Uh, I wanted to show this to you because this very likely was made with metal. Um, with, it has very finely chiseled edges of these crosses and these circles that cannot be made uh, with a boulder. And uh, th these we see in the, in the post-contact period. It's a lot easier to make an image with metal than it is with stone. And so this is a beautiful example of these Christian crosses um, made with metal. So um, to date, um, Chester told me that there are over 3,500 individual cross images that have been recorded on the Mesa. That's in the database. That's not including all the packs we have out, the nine packs that are currently being worked. Most of them are Latin crosses. And we've identified more than 25 styles of European crosses um, of those that have been recorded. And the reason we know this is that, that in 2013, our earlier project director and archeologist, Janet McKenzie, presented uh, this paper, Cross Connections, Religious Iconography of the Historic Period, Mesa Prieta and Area, at the International Federation of Rock Art Organizations in Albuquerque. And that this time we only had 3000 crosses. So one more for this category is a Latin cross on what could be a church. Now this image I put in here, and I don't know if John Kinchelow is listening, but this is an image that we found three or four times on the Mesa and usually down low, uh, close to the river and close to where there would be agricultural fields. This clearly is a Latin cloth cross. We're wondering if this represents a scythe, but we found this exact same image in several places. And um, again, it's, it's intriguing and um, makes the mind question what we're seeing. <clears throat> this image, um, the summer youth kids recorded and uh, Chester was with them. And um, I think the thing that you can see most prominently is the pounding that has removed the patina of a good part of this boulder. There is a cupule here and a cupule here. We feel we've found a number, we've probably found 20 of these boulders that have had this extensive pounding at the top of the boulder. And they almost always have either a cupule or a worked natural hole. There's a worked natural hole, even though it's not a very significant one. And we feel that these are shrines. Uh, Dr. Ford has gone to several of them and he agrees with us that these are shrines that pe people have returned to again and again to make more applications to. Now, when Chester went to the boulder with the kids and Chester pitch in if you have a comment, um, they tested it to see if it was a ringing rock. And they struck different angles of the rock with another stone and they were able to obtain acoustical tones. Um, we have a volunteer who's well known to many of you named Rob, Ron Barber, uh, who is doing a study on ringing rocks. He visits the Mesa quite often. And when we have boulders like this, we take him so that he can assess them. Um, but again, these are, these are culturally very, very important. Okay, um, the last time period we'll talk about is the Euro-American time period, which we kind of narrowed down from 1920 to the present. And these are the, the most recent petroglyphs that are made on the Mesa. We don't call them graffiti, but we give them their own time period. It used to be that they were graffiti and people would discount them, but we record them and give them importance. Most are made with metal tools. 
Some of them copy older Native American petroglyphs, adding creative modifications. And then, as I'll show you in a minute, in the late 1930s, the Depression era, Works Progress Administration workers also left their marks on the boulders. These images can be assumed to be time specific when dates are included. So here we are, down here in the right hand corner, um, we have on the Wales Petroglyph Preserve, uh, we have maybe 15 of these boulders that have WPA. Some of them have 1938, it's always the same date. And JVJ was a guy making these instead of doing the work he was supposed to be doing. So this is um, consistent. This exact um, iconography is consistent with about six boulders. And then we have about 12 more that have a combination or less of these. This image over here in the lower left was clearly made with metal, probably a knife, that someone carved their initials, AL, into the boulder. It's very bright, very recent. And then this one I love, and I think that um, Kathy and Susan recorded this, um, a home with a peaked roof, windows and a door, and for Filberto and Abelisa, Abelina are going to move in there and live. I love it. Their last name might be Martin. I love it. <clears throat> in addition to petroglyphs, we record cultural landscape features. We feel that they are very, very important and they tell the story of all of the people who used the mesa. There are many agricultural terraces and dams, gravel mulch fields, structures including rock walls and shelters, artifacts, ceramics and lithics, and trails of all time periods. Today, local people still use the trails on the Mesa, often to visit the images of stories long ago told. Um, lamb, um, sheep herding was very prominent on the Mesa in the 1800s into the 1960s. And we find corrals, fences, lambing pens high on the Mesa reflecting the important economic activities. Cattle grazing also occurred and still does occur to this day. We find horseshoes wound out, worn out by horses and mules of herders and travelers on the Mesa. Very often the nails are still intact. And we find animal bones with signs of butchering and evidence of ax and saw cut wood harvesting scene. We record ax cut trees. So here is a structure, a circular structure. It's lost whatever height it had. It could have been a corral. It could have been a shelter, we're not sure. Um, but we noticed that it, we know that it's human made and we recorded it. This is a hand tool. It's an axe and it has a broken tip. Uh, it was recorded and it was left in place. And that's usually what we do with artifacts. <clears throat> this image uh, is of a broken petro projectile point that was recorded by Jana Comstock. Um, she, she and Amy and uh, Kaz and, oh, uh, her team were on the west side of the Mesa and found this, left it in place per the request of the landowner. Um, and she, she typed it. It's Petternal Church. It was dates to the late archaic period of 2500 BCE to 700 BCE. It possibly is 4500 years old. And she typed it as a San Rafael side notched Mokino concave base. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> we have references for typing projectile points and they are listed here and then in, in addition we have um, <clears throat> mentors that we can go to uh, for help when we need it. Dr. Stephen Shackley who has the x-ray fluorescence lab in Albuquerque um, helps us with dating obsidian and then Dr. Bruce Huckle who is um, such a treasure at the University of New Mexico when we have uh, lithics that we feel may be paleo, we take, we take them down to him and he very patiently works through them with us. Um, we don't take these things casually. We want this information to go into our database for further researchers. Now I need to tell you a little bit about the work that um, Janice team is doing. She and Amy Montoya and Allison Young and Kaz uh, Kazminsky and Tony Ricketts, I think that's all of them, are working. Um, they wanted three proveniences on the top of the Mesa. And um, they started 
I thought that there would there was a vasita there that I thought would be loaded with um, features. There's nothing up on the top of the mesa, just a few agricultural things and some um, cores. But down at the bottom, Peg, uh, Amy started wandering around. And on the first day, they recognized probably 70 artifacts on the ground. They worked there for almost a year. <clears throat> Not every day. They only went once a month. And they identified um, artifacts dating from um, um, about 8,000 years ago up until um, probably 200 years ago, both in ceramics and in stone. Um, now they've moved on to other areas in the provenience. And they're right now they're working up against the wall. They're working on a very large corral for sheep. But all around the corral are these wonderful archaic images and archaic artifacts. They don't want to let any of these proveniences go to any other team. They've been there for two years and um, they're there. And they get up there early and they come down almost in the dark. They're the most enthusiastic team. And the wonderful thing about them is to have these two professionals of Janet and Amy uh, mentoring our, our recorders. And Tony Ricketts is a volunteer in the um, lab at OAS also. These are ceramics of which we find hundreds on the Mesa and record them. These are Tewa, Biscuit A, Biscuit B ceramics. Um, our teams record them. We don't expect them to be able to type them, but we want to get a documentation of what they look like. And you can see that they have identified two rim pieces and they have documented the, fr the front, the back, and the, and the profile. And down here you can see that there is a curvature to the profile of this piece. And this is diagnostic for people who um, work with ceramics that's diagnostic as to the time period. So even though we're not collecting these artifacts, we're collecting the data so that our um, researchers can uh, use it and have value. <clears throat> now, um, we are craving to find evidence of Paleo-Indian culture on the Mesa. Um, this refers to the late Pleistocene and early Holocene occupations in North America and encompasses the Clovis and Folsom cultures. The Clovis points date to the early, earliest Paleo-Indian period, roughly 14,000 to 9,000 BCE, 16,000 years ago. Clovis fluted points are named after the city of Clovis, where examples were found in 1929. The Folsom complex dates to between 9,000 BCE and 8,000 BCE, 11,000 years ago. And these, typical, these points are typically medium to large and they're lancelet spear points. <clears throat> to date, we have found three possible examples of Paleo-Indian lithics on the Mesa. We do not know who transported them there. It's often thought that people who, came, who worked lived on the Mesa may have found them elsewhere and brought them here to the Mesa, but we don't know and there's no way of knowing. And we have no way of resolving this puzzle. This is the first one that was found by Lynn Cravens back when we first started recording, probably in 2010 on Mr. Cook's land. And uh, we, we took this to Dr. Huckle in person. We collected the point and he was able to examine it. And this is the narrative that he provided that it was quartzite. It could be a preform for a point or a knife. The edges are unfinished. He has seen these occurrences in both paleo and arche archaic sites. And he questions whether this is an archaic preform found on a paleo site or a paleo produced lithic. We do not see large Puebloan biface points. That was his strongest suit. And also he said, we need to find points with a base. We need to have the rest of the point down here for a conclusive diagnosis. The next one it was found by T.D. Futch, who is an archaeologist who did the uh, survey on Mr. Cook's property for the um, El Huique mine. He found this Folsom point. He collected it and kept it. Um, this is the best picture that we have of it, unfortunately. We can see the size of it. This is a, this is a centimeter. This is a centimeter scale of 10 centimeters. So you can see the size of this point. Um, it, it's fine-grained basalt, which is typical of these older points. 
and it has a reversed hinge fracture. Uh, he compared it with a cluster of points found in Western North America and made quite a bit of diagnostic comments on it. But unfortunately, we don't have it. Now, we have a team working in the area where this point was found. Uh, Linda Brown and Ray Boboyne, who happen to be archaeologists, and Siobhan Hancock and Allison Youngs are, are working in this area. They have the coordinates of where the point was found, and they are scrutinizing for further evidence. This point was found um, about five years ago on a route coming down from the top of the mesa. Um, it's likely Pedernal Church. Its history it was likely broken during field use. There are percussive marks evident at the right side. You see these rings coming back. That's a sign of percussion that the point of this, um, of this projectile hit a bone or a rock. <clears throat> it just, um, Dr. These are Dr. Huckle's notes. It demonstrates selective pressure flaking described as parallel oblique pressure flaking, which is diagnostic of these older points. The thickness and width is greater than archaic points. This point is much more robust. <clears throat> the ridge near the, the, this is a break of the point, and you can see if this is a centimeter scale, right now we have almost four centimeters for part of the point. This is the break, and this note right here is a ridge that is actually the top of a fluted channel. The fluting goes upwards towards the point and ends abruptly at the ridge. So the base would be here and the fluting would go up to this ridge. Dr. Huckle is fairly certain this is a tip of a Clovis point, however, would not bet his paycheck on it. Um, and if so, this tip is dated to about 10,000 to 13,000 BCE. Again, we don't know. This is a this is a beautiful point. Charlie Hersey found it. He's on Margie Best's team. They found it near the rim of the mesa on a route, not a trail, and um, looked, of course, for the rest of it and couldn't find it. But um, it's it's a thrilling point. So other paleo rock Indian images that we don't know if these are paleo or not. This is a couple that's on tour seven of the Belts Petroglyph Preserve. And Dr. Ford has looked at it as well as a number of others. The cupule is eroded. There is nothing smooth about the base of this cupule, indicating that it has a lot of age. And Dr. H Dr. Uh, Ford feels that this may be a paleo cupule. It's very close to the river. This one, Allison found. Um, this is a, a hole that has not been worked actually. But look at these carefully made radiating lines you can see in her drawing that are repatinated almost to the base. They're a little lighter than those lines we saw that Kaz's team found. And then over here, this is on tour eight, um, up above Catherine Wells' house. And this is a very large boulder. And on the smooth part of the boulder, we're seeing these beautifully etched intentional um, lines. And uh, we're wondering, we want somebody with the knowledge that Dr. Lorendorf has to look at these and tell us what they are. So, um, John Pitts, who is the chief rat of the rat survey team, Rock Art Trekkers, asked me to include in this presentation what the teams will be looking forward to recording this year and next. Um, his team goes out and surveys proveniences upon assignment. He collects information about um, access, terrain, and then the um, uh, types of images and the, and the numbers of images within. They do a very superficial uh, run through and give us documentation that I can then give to the teams. So uh, we have this teams um, for the future for you. I wanna again thank our wonderful recorders and surveyors without their hard work, boots on the ground, uh, this, in, this information would not be available to us. Um, they are the best group of, of volunteers I can imagine. And they're all listed here. And there is a big thank you for all of you. So we have a few minutes. Um, and so do we have some questions, Ethan? Yes, we do. Um, and Candy, thank you so much for your presentation tonight. The work you guys do is amazing. My pleasure. I definitely have some questions that I'll have to ask you offline about um, about the, the historic period petroglyphs that you guys had. But we can we can wait for for another time. Okay. 
<laughs> All right. Um, so uh, the first question up we have is from Karen. She says there are several sites with scratched petroglyphs in uh, Imperial County near Indian Pass. Is the scratched petroglyph near a trail? Let's see. Um, one of them, the one that had the hole, is on a on a hill that has a shrine and it has trails going to it, yes. Um, the other one in the Wells Petroglyph Preserve is near a large, very large agricultural site. And there is a trail going through there. It's not necessarily on the trail, though. All right. And then the next question is from Colin. And uh, they ask, are there any oral traditions among the Tewa people today or testimonials captured by the Spanish at the time of their arrival, which can help us interpret the meaning or purpose of the images? That's a very good question. And we have volunteers who are uh, integrated with the Tewa, our Tewa neighbors that are working on exactly that um, topic. And I'm not really qualified to talk about that. I don't know enough about that. Um, we know the Tewa, our Tewa neighbors are welcome to come to the Mesa. They're welcome to come to the Wells per Petroglyph Preserve at any time. Their access is, is, is free and we welcome them there. Awesome. And if I can add to that a little bit, um, Colin, we do have uh, several oral histories from the Tewa people that are um, curated here uh, at New Mexico Historic Sites. Um, and then also, you know, just a, a note to think about that, um, you know, after 1598, uh, we have the indigenous Tewa people and the Spanish living very closely together. And so, you know, we often think of them as two different people groups. And I mean, they definitely are two different culture groups here today. But there's also a lot of intermixing and acculturation that happens back and forth, too. So um, there's definitely oral histories that flow back and forth between both cultures um, that relate to specific petroglyphs. Yes. yes. All right. So uh, Karen asks, could your headless guy be a frog? Good point, Karen. Um, go back and look at that image. Um, I can do that real quickly. Um, there he is. Um, possibly. Okay. He still would. So. <laughs> All right, and the next question is from Jane, and she asks, how can I sign up to volunteer? Go to our website, Jane. Go to mesaprietapetroglyphs.org and um, look, under, look under in the menu for volunteering. There's a huge amount of information on the website, and uh, you can learn how to volunteer there. Uh, word of note, with COVID, um, we are pretty well shut down. We're not having any trainings at this time. We're having these wonderful virtual presentations. But uh, until COVID is over, um, we are not really doing any group activities, such as trainings. And so it looks like uh, Chester has also posted a reply to that comment with a link. So if any other viewers are interested, you can, you can definitely follow that link. Uh, Jane also asks, if you use iPhone cameras to photograph images, have you tried portrait mode? No, our settings are all, um, we provide cameras to our recorders and we set the settings and we don't want them to change the settings. <laughs> um, yes, I think we are using portrait mode on close-ups such as cultural landscape features such as lithics. Um, but I don't know that we are using them on the petroglyphs. All right, and we have a comment from Connie. She says, great presentation, Candy. Thanks for a glimpse of the Southwest. <laughs> Thank you, Connie. Okay, so that's all of our questions from the Mesa Prieta page. Let me go over to, um, or from the, uh, New Mexico Historic Sites page. Let me go to the other page and we'll take a look. Okay, 
Uh, we have a question from Chris Herbs, uh, and they ask, what was between 500 and 800 CE between the archaic and ancestral Puebloan? Was it basket maker? Were there people living in the area during that time? And are there petroglyphs from that era? That's a really, really good question. And I wish we knew the answer. We feel that the Mesa was minimally used during that time. Um, very likely we would associate any activity with the archaic people, um, but we have not really identified um, iconography or cultural aspects for that time period. Uh, Gary asks, are any of these related to solstice or equinox shadow patterns? Oh, what a wonderful question. Absolutely. And again, Ron Barber, who is very well known here in the um, northern New Mexico area, has done extensive studies on solar calendars and uh, on Mesa Prieta and has a number of disciples because you can't be at all of them at, this, at one time on, on June 21st. Um, we have many, many um, solar calendars and uh, suggestions of um, celestial uh, connotations. Yes. Kathy asks, how many petroglyph sites have you recorded so far? Well, um, we're working on a total, Mr. Cook's property encompasses 6,800 acres. And we have completed about a little less than 50% of that. And then with the other small properties, um, I don't have the acreage in mind, but we have the small properties, we have recorded probably 15 other small properties. Um, so a lot. <laughs> All right, and uh, Ruthie asks, what is the significance of the horns? The horns of the serpent? I cannot answer that. That's, there's a lot of literature, a lot in the literature of the Avanyu. Uh, she could just um, do some research on that and we'll find that uh, these mythological creatures are um, very dominant in northern New Mexico, central New Mexico, down to Mesoamerica. They have incredible, there's been an incredible amount of research done on them. So I would encourage her to just research. Great, and Ruthie also asks, are the cross line etchings possibly corn plants? Um, good question. Um, we do have a couple of images of maize or corn and they are more suggestive of a corn plant. Um, they don't have the angulated cross lines on them, but they would have more of a, a gradual arcing of um, a suggestion of leaves. Um, so I can't say that they're not, but I would say we have better examples. Great, and so one last comment, Gary says, this was wonderful. Well, thank you, Gary. Thank you for joining us. All right, so I think that's about all the questions that we have left. So thank you again, okay. Candy, so much for, for your time tonight. And thank you for all of the work that you put into to helping document uh, these wonderful petroglyphs that are all over the Mesa here. Thank you, absolutely. Thank you, Ethan, for promoting this. Absolutely. And uh, just a reminder to all of our viewers, our next lecture will be on September 29th at 6 p.m. Uh, and that is going to be a talk by Tim Wilcox uh, from Crow Canyon, and uh, they'll be speaking about gubernador polychrome pottery. So we hope to see you there. Have a nice evening.